Welcome to the Bioptimizer's awesome health podcast. And now here's your host, Wade T. Lightheart. What if you could double your energy naturally without caffeine or stimulants in just three short months? It's not only possible, you can transform every aspect of your health if you follow the 12-week blueprint we've created for you in the Awesome Health System. The Awesome Health System is a free course where you receive a daily video lesson spanning the most cutting-edge secrets for air, water, exercise, sunshine, optimizers, mindset, and education. It's something most companies would charge hundreds of dollars for, yet you get it for free when you go to buyoptimizers.com. To access your course, register to download the PDF report called Three Phases of Bioptimization, which gets you access to the report and daily access to the first lesson in the 12-week, 84-day Awesome Health course. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It's Wade T. Lightheart with another edition of the Awesome Health Podcast from Bioptimizers. And today we're going to talk about an area that I've really been working on, but there's a lot of confusion. And that comes down to stretching and flexibility and how both can cause more harm than good. And today we have an expert. His name is Yogi Aaron, who is a trailblazing yoga teacher who is leading a global rebellion against the harmful (laughs) practice of stretching. He pioneered the approach to yoga that shows people how to live pain-free. In a world where conventional stretching and flexibility practices are the prescribed norm for pain, Yogi Aaron's unorthodox method provides a safer and more effective permanent solution. He is the author of Stop Stretching and the creator of the revolutionary approach to yoga, Applied Yoga Anatomy, plus muscle activation called Ayama, which sounds very Sanskrit. And he joins us today from Costa Rica. Welcome to the show. Great to have you here, Yogi Aaron. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. So I think this is awesome. First off, (laughs) uh, you know, I, I've I've been you know coming from living a long time on the west coast of Canada. There mm-hmm. is a massive yoga community there, and there's a lot of gurus and teachers and babas and you know there's you know and, and I followed the Eastern mysticism more bent on Patanjali's version of yoga, which is Yama and Niyama and Asana, etc. You know, and all that process. And so most of my yoga experience was primarily in the meditative component and not much mm-hmm. in the Hatha or the exercises or, 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 or Asana practice that is a part of the Eightfold Path. And since that time, and of course, it, like Chip from Lululemon was literally making my posing trunks as a bodybuilder back in the days. And it was starting the Lululemon movement. And then the whole thing exploded. And then yoga became a lot. It seemed to deviate and there's a value within it, but there's also a conflict within it. And it seems Mm -hmm. to me that you're very aware of those two things. So it's like, is yoga how good my yoga pants fit and how contorted (laughs) I can be? My chiropractor says that he would say every single yogi that he knows at a certain point, they're going to blow out their back in this particular way because they're overstretching and create these weaknesses. And then there's the flat yoga butts. And I was a muscle guy. It's like like everything gets pulled for. And then so there's all these things about, hey, I feel great when I do yoga. I feel great when I stretch. I like this feeling. But if it's unchecked, there can be some problems that arise out of that. So it seems to me that you are exposing those and I'm sure that's an interesting adventure. So how did this whole thing happen for you? Tell us the journey. How did you get to become a yogi and then a rebellion yogi? And then now you're on this mission to rewrite the disjointed yoga paths. So first of all, I don't know if you knew this, but I'm actually originally from Vancouver Oh, and, wow. Um, so I, you know, I was around, you know, watching the yoga community sort of growing 
but mm-hmm. it kind of reached this point sort of around mid nineties, I would say was, which is sort of when I really started getting into it, you know, and I remember practicing with people like Wade Morissette and, yep. um, and watching, as you said, Lululemon growing. And yeah. it's just mind blowing to me that it was almost akin to it being sold in like a thrift you know, kind of West Coast store to now being this international multi-chain store sold worldwide around, you know, the, the, the world. And it's just, it's fascinating. I mean, my hat's off to Lululemon. I'm very proud as a Canadian to see that brand uh, grow like it did, knowing that it grew literally on my backyard on, uh, what was it? Fourth street in right on fourth. Yeah. So. Right on fourth. I, 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 <laughs> in, literally in Carisdale. <laughs> yeah. My hair, my hairstyle, my hairstylist had a, had an adjacent part where he was doing it, doing yeah. stuff at the swim co place down there. Yeah. And, and then of course he was formulating all of the posing trunks for everybody in the bodybuilding yes. community. And then that, that explosion, he had Sempra Viva and all those places that kind of took off. And then, all of a sudden, he designed gear that was really cool for yoga. But yeah. then, concordantly, I think right in alignment with that clothing thing became this whole culture that emerged like massively. So they they kind of, I don't know which was feeding what, yeah. but now there's just, when you say yoga, I mean, what does that even mean anymore? Like who? What does it mean? So, yeah. So, so, so explain that, like unpack that journey for us, because I think this is really cool and relevant. Yeah, no, I mean, I love that you just brought it home for me because that's where my yoga journey, you know, really bore its roots. I grew up in a very kind of, for lack of better words, hippy dippy kind of family. I used to hang out at the Spiritual Healing Center in Vancouver mm-hmm. Um over on commercial drive. And um, so that was my stomping ground for a long time. But I was also in, this is kind of going a little bit deeper than I normally share in the story, but it's kind of all relevant because I had this very love hate relationship with anything spiritual simultaneously going on. I grew up very much as a Christian uh, evangelical Christian in an evangelical Christian household so it was kind of like anything sort of spiritual slash religious. I was like, no. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> and so, but simultaneously, I was really noticing that my body was tightening up and that I needed to gain mobility because I noticed that people that got old and looked old Um, looked that way because they just didn't have any kind of mobility in their body. They became like stiff boards. Yeah. So I kind of, yeah, the stiff biff. So I kind of had that intuitive awareness. And so the solution then was to stretch. And um, I thought yoga could be a good discipline, or at least the physical part of it. And it wasn't like a straight line. My sort of yoga journey meandered, but it was always about stretching and, um, that kind of got me into the Ashtanga. That's why I ended up hanging out a lot with Wade, um, who met up with his sister. His sister met up with him in India, ergo, thank you, India. Um, and so that was sort of my community at that time was just, you know, hardcore power yoga, Ashtanga yoga. Um, let's kick out our practice and see how right. far we can put our foot behind our head. And the <laughs> The deeper, <laughs> the deeper I got into it, uh, that really started to change me in a very profound way. In fact, I would actually honestly say to you uh, that it was Wade, uh, who probably doesn't really remember this to this day, but he one day he turned to me and said, Aaron, you don't really have a practice. And that was like a turning point for me to start understanding I needed a teacher. I needed, you know, a guide. Mm -hmm. I needed some sort of external guide. What really kept me coming back. So there was definitely the physiological aspects. My hips were opening. My hamstrings were getting a little looser. 
of course, I was, you know, in my mid 20s, early 20s, late 20s. And so I was really healthy and um, I could do this kind of hardcore stuff to myself. And of course, I felt good, you know, um, doing all of this stuff. But psychologically, what I started to notice the most was that my ability to focus really started to sharpen. I was a kind of a kid who suffered a lot from ADD. Back then, they didn't know how to diagnose it. My parents, you know, sent me to get tested. I mean, I was even being considered at, I'm just going to do an air quotes for your listeners, a special school. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't know what they call them these days, but I was being considered uh, first, you know, because I just couldn't focus in school and they didn't know what to do with me. Um, Thank God they didn't have Ritalin back then because I think that would have really damaged me. But yoga was one of the first yeah, things I always, I, just as a sidebar that it's like like no one takes account of me that schooling is just boring <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, no, like well, if, there's that maybe you're there, not there. maybe you don't have attention deficits or maybe you're just so boring I can't pay attention to you how about that one Let's make- yeah. <laughs> well and I went to an old boys boarding school which had right. a little it wasn't a military school but it had that sort of military outdoor flair in Alberta where we dog sled snowshoe, took three week canoe trips, uh, went hiking in the Rockies. So there was a lot of, of activity to keep me focused. And that's what I always used to help mm. focus me or at least dispel some of that excessive energy. Um, but when I got back into the real world, you know, my attention was always all over the place. But yoga uh, started to help me harness the power of my mind and attention And so that's what kind of kept me going into it. But very quickly after starting it, I hurt my back. And so I would go to yoga teachers and I would say, hey, I've got back issues. And so they would, you know, come up and adjust me in seated forward folds and push me further. Whenever I do child's pose, they would push me further. Uh, Whenever I was stretching my hamstrings, they would, you know, help me stretch them more. But my back problems just got worse and worse. And so that started developing into this like chronic pain injury, uh, chronic pain series. And that's kind of what led me 25 years later into the emergency room of a hospital uh, when I said, okay, um, maybe something I'm doing isn't, you know, uh, right. What don't I understand about the body? Um, To go back to your question, I I just wanted to circle back to that. For me, like getting into more of the spiritual aspects of yoga wasn't a straight line. And but I've been very blessed, I feel like over, you know, the years to have solid yoga teachers in my life. And when I say yoga teachers, I don't mean like, um, how well can you do triangle pose? I'm talking about like the more spiritual aspects. And so I've been really introduced to the more um, sublime aspects of our tradition. And, and it's been kind of like watching this dual screen because since I opened Blue O's in Costa Rica and I kind of like take a peek into the world of yoga and I see like, you know, going back to Lululemon, Lululemon flashing across the screen and people in their tidy whities you know, um, doing yoga. And so it's very fascinating to me to kind of watch where it's going. And that's been part of my mission moving forward, especially is to flip the script in yoga. Like what is yoga supposed to be about? And let's get back to that. Let's try to return to that. Yeah. Let's talk about that for just a second. Cause you mentioned um, some of the more spiritual aspects of yoga. And I made a brief reference to Patanjali's eightfold path and and, you know, it starts out with the essentially the moral and ethical values that you need to kind of ascribe to, right? You know, yama and yama, and you get into asana and pranayama, which is breath work, and then, you know, pratahara, dharana, and dhyana, and then samadhi, the ultimate state of enlightenment, where there's the dissolution yeah. of the ego identification of self, and one merges with pure consciousness. And, um, my whole connection to that was opened up through um, Paramahansa Yogananda's book, Autobiography and Yogi, which I read in 1996, and then had my own kind of crisis in 2000 that uh, 
from a series of interesting events that led to me pursuing that path down off, off of commercial. They used to have a little place off Charles Street on commercial. There was a center and I started going to that center and start taking the classical lessons as iterated from Yogananda for a Western audience, which is very different than the guru disciple relationship in the, the, in the East. And he was criticized widely in the East for commercializing the conceptual ideas for a Western audience here in the West and was probably the father of the entire yoga exposure. I mean, before that there was Vivekananda who I read some of his books that came, but he couldn't stay in the West. And so yoga and Yogananda was, and then all of these plethora of teachers have emerged from the East ever since. Why am I saying that? Well, what, what influences did you get in your kind of spiritual sojourn around yoga that uh, what made a difference for you to kind of start considering the deeper aspects than just postures and things like that? Yeah, it definitely for the longest time. I, I mean, when I say the longest time up until like 29, 30, I was a huge staunch diehard ashtanga yogi and you know ashtanga was the only path and you know that sort of dogma dogmatic attitude comes from my evangelical background you know sure. like you've got to find the path and then this is the right path and there's no other path right and if you can't do ashtanga then you're an and you're not, you know, <laughs> worth the salt of my attention. Um, I love it. So, <laughs> you just illustrated the mindset of that. You know, I've been down those roads before, so I totally love it. <laughs> so, I mean, I, you know, I can look back and just laugh at the naivety. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in, the, in yoga, one of the things that we're always seeking to undo is our own, in, in the Sanskrit word is avidya our own mm -hmm. ignorance. And the problem with the video is that you just don't know what you don't know until you know that you didn't know. And hopefully we can just unknow a little bit of what we don't know so that we know a little bit more of what we don't know. And it's a very circular thing, but it's kind of like a child, you know, teenagers, <laughs> we're looking at these kids right now in the world and who think they know everything. And my dad, when I was 16, put this sign up on his refrigerator, it said, teenagers move out now while you still know everything <laughs> and so yeah. so but to go to your back to your question i so in my yoga journey it kind of led me to new york city and i know that's kind of weird to say that but it did and that's kind of a long story i can tell it if you want to but when i moved to new york city uh one of the very first questions that i kind of was sitting well there's two one, I really wanted to learn more yoga. I wanted to find a teacher. And the second question I had was, which is might sound a little strange, but what is Tantra? And I had heard so mm. much about Tantra. And so with those two questions in mind, one of my students came up to me. I started a, a yoga community very quickly moving to New York. I was very lucky. And one of my students came up to me and handed me this brochure uh, that was from um, Kripalu, and Kripalu is this yoga center in um, Massachusetts. Um, and they closed down for a few years because of COVID. I believe that they're starting to reintegrate things. But in there, I was just flipping through and it was like the summer catalog of things. And I was like, I really want to go to Kripalu and I want to find like, you know, something to do because this is exactly why I moved to New York. Right there, Living Tantra with Rod Stryker. I mean, it was like, you know, it, it was like it just dropped from heaven. I asked the question, it just dropped. And I, I said, I need to go and learn from this guy. And Rod ended up becoming my teacher for over a decade, pretty much. And I studied with Rod and he, his teacher is a, a man named Pandaji Rajmani Tiganai, who's the spiritual leader of the Himalayan Institute and his teacher uh, with Swami Rama mm -hmm. of the Himalayas. And so I immediately, after studying with Rod, took a nosedive into eating anything that came from Swami Rama and Pandaji, and then had the privilege of actually studying with Pandaji a few times. On one occasion, I actually went to India with Pandaji. 
Um, and, and then also Rod's other teacher, Alan Finger, uh, who started Ishta Yoga. Um, but Alan, you know, roots go all the way back to LA in the 70s and even way before that. And so I studied with Alan Finger. And so I had like these really incredibly, um, incredible teachers that had deep roots in this Himalayan tradition. Um, and so I was very fortunate to have that as sort of my source. Um, and it was fascinating studying with them all because they all kind of gave different parts of the tradition and I was able to adjust certain practices and each of them um, opened up or shined a light on different parts of the practice that I think only evolved as I, you know, did the practice myself. I mean, I can give you a whole lecture on two sutra two, um, I think it's 249, 250, 251, which is all about pranayama. Most of it will go over your head unless you actually go do a practice in it. So I, I was very fortunate to have like that all in synchronicity with them. And it was through them that I was able to start having a deeper understanding of yeah, this is way beyond triangle pose. <laughs> yeah, <point>. yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's so interesting. That's what I find so interesting is that yeah. all of the various disciplines as known in most yoga classes that people are doing is just focusing on one of those things, which is the sauna. Yeah. And ironically, Patanjali's whole philosophy was, yeah. look, look, like, let's get the, the do's and don'ts of worked out first before yeah. we go down this pathway and i found that always so fascinating i felt lucky that i got exposed to the esoteric side before any of the yoga stuff because it was like oh okay i i seem to have luckily placed it in the right basket as opposed to you know asanas and poses and styles is, is the only thing Yes. which is so pervasive in the community and obviously leads to yeah okay it's it, it's become a fitness class as opposed to a pathway to yoga means for those who don't know it means union yeah right? it's to yoke one's soul to the divine intelligence and then and there's a and there's a definitive process so it sounds to me that you actually literally went through that patanjali's process which appears serendipitously through the right teacher or the right learning or whatever, but I don't think it is. I think it's actually, that is the progressive realization as one unfolds the what is it, 72,000 different neural pathways in your body. And all of a sudden you come up against these conscious consciousness problems. You, you, yeah. you come with these, uh, you know, in, in Zen philosophy, they would use a cone. You become to these unresolvable differences that, well, what about this and what about this? And they seem to be in conflict. But what the conflict is, is your own awareness is not able to contain what seems like polarizations because you don't have a better framework. And then when you resolve that, it's like, oh, of course. I can move out of redundancy and restriction. I can move out of, you know, zealotry. I can move out of those. And it seems to be that that leads to where you are now is that, hey, I'm talking, I'm a, a, I go by the name of Yogi Aaron and I'm telling you, stop stretching. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> you know like, like, wait a second. <laughs> like, how do you resolve this? Isn't that what yoga is about? Like, you know, is it about like doing downward dog and pigeon pose and happy baby and all these things, right? Like, what yeah. is it? So, so um, take that a little further for us. Like, what, what unfolded for you to kind of get to this message? Cause we went back to the hot, you had that pain program you're in this conflict situation so what was the resolution to that like what was your what what did you come to the conclusions around that yeah sure i oh my god there's so much to unpack in what you were just saying um uh i feel well okay let's get right to your question so there's as I mentioned, I was going through, a, I had a, a, a big chronic pain journey that I was going through. And by the time I actually met Rod, I had, was dealing with a torn hamstring uh, and sciatic pain um, on the left side. And so, so that was, and then 
you know, very shortly after that, I started messing up my neck and shoulders. And so I was having a uh, searing neck pain. It was like somebody was driving a dagger into my scapula. Um, and so there's nice. like all of these kind of like different things going on. And in the meantime, I'm learning and understanding what yoga is. And so there's like that going on also. And, but as I was saying for, there was always this struggle and it was an, an internal struggle of, well, what do the postures mean to me? How deep should I go? And, um, that always kind of affected me because I never really understood like what as a yogi, as a, as someone who's aspiring to be a yogi, what are the postures supposed to be for me? And so Rod would illuminate a lot. And I wish, sometimes I wish I paid more attention, but this is part of the problem with our teachers is they'll say one thing, but then do another thing. And so sometimes what they're doing and in Rod's case, like, you know, he would demonstrate a pose and then go into the quote unquote full expression of the pose. And so as a student, you see that and you go, well, that's what I should be doing. If I'm a great yogi or want to be a great yogi, I should be able to do that. And so that was always my my rub. And um, and then using the postures as a way to access parts of my mind. So I, in that sense, I am. I, I am still to this day and, and always have strived to be a, a real Hatha yogi. And so Hatha, and I'm saying this for your listeners, because we've been talking a lot about perfecting poses, but in the science of Hatha, which it is a science, that it's really about how do we access the primordial energy in our body and um, kind of reshape it, if you will. So you know, for someone who's got or had ADD, you know, my energy is going everywhere. And through the practice of asana and doing deep breathing, that energy is starting to go in one direction. And mm -hmm. that's just a very simplistic layman's explanation. But that's kind of like what Hatha is, is the science of energy management and, and utilizing this primordial energy that we have in our body to start going hopefully driving towards our enlightenment. But when I finally ended up in the hospital, it was after about a year of what I would say kind of intense yin style practice of yoga, you know, and yin for your listeners, this kind of yoga that's out there where you do long holds and you do these, these postures and you hold them for long periods of time. And I didn't know what else to do. There wasn't like, I didn't have anybody in my corner to say, Aaron, you should be doing this. I had a lot of people giving me massages. I had a lot of people saying I should roll on stuff. I had people like say I should dig into my psoas to release it, but nothing worked. And then I ended up in the hospital uh, with an orthopedic surgeon saying to me that I was probably going to need a spinal fusion in my lower back. And at that time I was around 45. And there was this deep feeling of shame. Mm. Um, there is this deep feeling of uncertainty, of course. And, and then also like WTF, what have I been doing for the last 25 years? Right. That has led me to this moment. So I kind of took a step back and I said, like, what is it that I don't know? Or what is it that I don't understand about the body? And that kind of question or that kind of openness <laughs> led yeah. me to um, understanding or, or on the path of what's called muscle activation. And, and that, that journey into muscle activation, more specifically muscle activation technique, uh, which I ended up studying, um, led me to understanding the body in a very profound way that I, I didn't understand the body before. As a yoga teacher, I thought, oh my God, I, I, I mean, obviously I'm not a doctor, but I understand biomechanics. I understand, you know, how to, to stretch the body. I understand alignment. And when, after I doing muscle activation technique, cause it's a deep dive into biomechanics. Um, it's a deep dive into the muscular system, how muscles work. 
Um, you literally get your hands-on experience in that. So you get to feel um, muscles working and how they're working from insertion to origin. And I was like, I don't know anything. <laughs> I, didn't uh, know yeah. anything. I thought I knew a lot. I didn't know bub kiss. And, and that was kind of like a big turning point for me because I realized if I didn't know much, and I, and I was quoting all of these great teachers, they didn't know much. And mm. then it started making me think, okay, we need, we need, there's a lot in the yoga world that we need to flip the script on uh, and start changing <laughs> pronto. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. So, um, so what was the outcome of that realization in this new muscle activation study? What happened then? Well, the first thing is I, I slowly started putting my body back together again. Um, I started getting stronger. Um, uh, I understood why I was in so much pain in understanding the weakness. So I initially got into yoga cause I was stiff, but one of the key areas I was really stiff was my hamstrings. And, you know, I was like, you know, stiff Biff who could fold forward, but barely get his hands packed past his knees. And so I was already having that stiff board kind of feeling. And that's what got me into stretching. Uh, so I started understanding why my hamstrings were tight and, and being able to get myself stronger. But what I started to realize, well, there was, when I got into studying muscle activation technique, at the very least, it was to grow my own knowledge, but at the most, it was like I wanted to kind of look at how I could reshape some of my curriculum because I do a lot of, I lead a lot of yoga teacher trainings. And so I did, I started implementing, bringing this into uh, yoga. That was my big question. How do I start translating this into yoga? Where, where, does, where does muscle activation in yoga meet? How does it work together? Um, how do we, you know, take out the stretching part and bring in the muscle activation part? And so that was, that's been a big, or was a big part of the journey, especially at the beginning was experimenting with that a lot. I see. So for people who, um, don't understand, if we talk about any time that you are creating a contractal force or a stretching yes. force there is an agonist muscle, the muscle that is doing the contraction, and there's an antagonist muscle that's doing the stretching. Yes. And, and we've all heard the term muscle bound, which is yeah. you become so concentrated on one particular area that creates tension and suboptimal countermeasures inside of that. And there's yeah. a whole training philosophy in sports now it's, you know, activating myotatic reflex and Golgi tendon uh, firing and things like that. But in the yoga world, primarily it was just like, you know, stretching, but not the activation of some muscles. So it was, was basically, if I heard you correctly, it seems that you began to realize this, that all of this stretching in other areas was causing a counteractive effect and some muscles were locked up and some muscles were not firing. And then you had to kind of unwind that. Would that be an accurate assessment? The Bioptimizer mission is to help more of the world fix their digestion at a core level. The truth is your digestion is only as good as your enzyme levels. Imagine trying to build a house with a tree. It's impossible. You need to chop the tree down into small pieces. Similarly, in order for your food to be used by your body, it must be broken down into a bioavailable form. And that's what enzymes do, converting protein into amino acids, fats into specific fatty acids, and carbohydrates into usable energy units. We start out with an abundance of enzymes, and that's why kids can digest just about anything really quickly. The thing is, is Cooking food kills enzymes as they cannot survive at temperatures above 118 degrees. So years of this ends up depleting our bodies and leads to weak digestion. Taking digestive enzymes like masszymes, which has an incredibly high level of protease for digesting protein, as well as other critical enzymes like lipase, amylase, and others is a total game changer. Suddenly you strengthen your digestion, eliminate gas and bloating, boost metabolism, and multiply your energy. Most importantly, you fix your digestion at a core level.
To get started with Masszymes and to save 10% on your first order, go to Masszymes.com. That's M-A-S-S-Z-Y-M-E-S.com and use the code MASS10, M-A-S-S-1-0. You're on the right track. Um, absolutely. That's a very good assessment. I So when I say flip the script, that is a very loaded statement. It means a lot of different things. But one of the things that it means is, let's come back to stiff Biff for a second. So if stiff Biff is folding forward, like I was when I was 18 and can barely get his hands past his knees, you as the observer, what is your thought? You know, you're walking past stiff Biff with a yoga friend. You guys are probably turning to each other and going, oh my God, look at him. He needs to stretch his hamstrings. He needs right. to open his back. But that's the absolute wrong way to, to look at that. As you were just saying that there's an agonist and antagonistic relationship. And so what I find just kind of amusing, by the way, and this is like, now I know what I didn't know kind of point of reference is I just can't believe that we've just thrown that knowledge out that yeah. when we, when, when one muscle is contracting, the other muscle is now you use the word stretching. That isn't really, it's not accurate. really, it's, it's, it's not, not really, really accurate. It's, it's better to say that it's relaxing yes. or, or lengthening. Like it's just, and, and the lengthening is natural. Like it's not. So if you, if you, are lying on your back and you bring one leg up and your leg only goes so far because your hamstring is tight. That tightness is a symptom of the quad muscles not contracting properly. And so because they're not contracting, the body is tightening up the hamstring saying, hey, we're not comfortable going past this range of motion. Now, there's a lot of reasons out there. And, and but the real reason is because the body is saying, we don't want to go past this range of motion because if we do, we're not going to be stable. So we're stopping here. So muscle tightness is actually a biomechanical response. It's a protective mechanism uh, by the body. And so what we need to do, and this comes back to now to stiff Biff, if we want stiff Biff to get more mobility, we want him to be able to pick up his dropped keys that are on the floor. What we need to do is get his hit the core muscles. We'll call them the core muscles for now. They're really the trunk flexors. Um, but the core muscles need to start being able to contract properly. And mm -hmm. this is another kind of like fact that we've forgotten in this whole conversation about stretching. So the fact is, Muscles have two jobs, basically. They move bones and they stabilize joints. And so in order for muscles to stabilize joints and move bones, aka stiff bit folding forward, muscles have to shorten. <laughs> they have to be able to contract and they have to be able to contract more specifically, contract and contract on demand. So the tightness in stiff bits, hamstrings and, and lower back is really a symptom of all of these core muscles not working properly. So that's, that's where we need to flip the script in yoga. Mm -hmm. It's no longer about how much can we lengthen muscles. Muscles don't need to lengthen. This is like one of the biggest myths that are out there, mm -hmm. unless you're going to be a Cirque du Soleil, you know, uh, contortionist which they end up needing an, a huge amount of surgical intervention at some point that unless you're going to be one of those people, you don't need long muscles. You need muscles that are going to be able to contract and contract on demand, mm -hmm. uh, shorten properly. So obviously <laughs> this journey led you through an, a big adventure and you were able to correct your current conditions and then. Yes. Took, and so how long did it take you to correct you, you know, your previous unknowingness is. <laughs> um, I, well, I was able to heal pr relatively quickly in the bigger sense from ending up in the hospital. That's partly due to my tenacity in, you know, learning things and trying things uh, coupled with me starting to 
dive into this or fulfilling this yearning to study muscle activation uh, technique. As I got into it, I started practicing it on other people. And one of the things about the muscle activation technique world at that time, and it's starting to change a little bit now, there really was no way to translate this into the quote unquote fitness world, or more specifically, which was my lane, the yoga world. And that's how I came up with a Yama applied yoga anatomy and muscle activation. I came up, by the way, the applied yoga great anatomy, term, by the way, that's a great term. Thank you. And by the way, a Yama, I didn't believe me, this was not intentional. It was like the applied yeah. yoga anatomy and muscle activation. One day, somebody on my team said, Aaron, how, you know, how did you come up with a Yama? And I looked at them and I said, what is a Yama? <laughs> right. That's and then. Funny. I, I didn't even like, it wasn't even in my consciousness. And then I actually thought about a Yama, as you know, the very first limb is Yama. And what does Yama mean? It means to restrain, to contain actually. And so in Sanskrit, anytime you put a word a before it, it's the opposite of, so this is like you know, unrestrained power. <laughs> that's, that's what a Yama means. But the applied yoga anatomy part of it was to bring in a much needed biomechanical conversation into the yoga world. Like we talked, for example, about forward bends, Uttanasana being a, a very important way to work trunk flexors. But if you ask most yoga teachers, well, what are the trunk flexors and how is Uttanasana helping trunk flexion? They'll look at you. I bet you, if you asked a thousand yoga teachers, all of them would look at you a thousand out of a thousand would look at you with like question marks in their eyes. And like, you've got four heads, they wouldn't know how to answer that. And that's a real disservice. I think in the yoga world, that we just don't know what we're talking about. We talk about mm -hmm. hip flexion, but very none of us understand the mechanics of hip flexion. All of us are more obsessed with opening our hips and opening our hips. If you think about that biomechanically, it's like, what are we telling people to do? Dislocate their hips? Because <laughs> that's what literally opening your hips is um, means. So that's, that's where the gamma part and then bringing in the muscle activation. So if we're talking about doing a forward fold, what are we actually doing is we're trying to get those trunk flexors activated and working mm. properly. That's, that's, that's a very uh, astute integration. And so at what point did you take on the term Yogi Aaron? I'm curious about that. That's a great title. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, Yogi Aaron was sort of an organic, uh, thing that popped up. So the long story short is when I was living in New York, I started a naked men's yoga group called hot nude yoga. And, um, it became this sort of, well, time out New York called it an underground sensation. They came and did a huge piece about us. And, um, and so I did that for 10 years and then transitioned to opening up blue Osa yoga retreat. And I realized very quickly, cause this was by 2010, the power of Google was already there. And I knew right away, if I listed myself as Aaron star, people would <laughs> go down this rabbit hole, <laughs> um, right. you know, and, and so I just didn't want people to associate uh, my yoga retreat with being a naked place, because then I knew that we would never get anybody there. So, right. um, so then I just thought, well, let's just go with Yogi Aaron. And uh, it wasn't like a straight line. It was sitting with it for a while. And um, that's kind of how I became Yogi Aaron from Aaron yeah, there, Star. <laughs> there, are, there, I, 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 there are no straight lines in the universe, which is, I think, something that a lot of people have a hard time grasping with their, you know, Cartesian dominance yes. in our two-dimensional representations of the world, which are very limiting in, in, in ways that it's hard to comprehend unless you've really studied thought and paradigms and philosophies and ideologies and how they imprint on 
because of the way the neurophysiology works and how we start to accept things and that leads us to certain limitations and then essentially yeah. yoga is the repathwaying of those convenient but non inclusive conceptualizations that lead to the formation of our brain and so i don't think when people look think of the true practice of yoga of how actual scientific it actually really is it's not about a bunch of po pose the poses are not them in themselves in order to do there's a, there there is a neurophysiological component to the process of the pose which most people miss or don't fully grasp and by really studying and getting into that then you can start unlocking things and of course the master is knowing exactly what thing to do for what person based on you know a direct intuitive perception of the situation which is a combination of experience and divinity and a bunch of other things but let's talk about your retreat and your yoga rebellion <laughs> you know i i i almost feel like this you know it's like men marching through the street and burning yoga pants like the 60s you know what what what, what is the yoga rebellion and why is your clinic so important in costa rica or your your so, retreat or whatever I, I don't know i hate to use the word retreat or like what is that place anyways your, your center so so there's kind of two things going on. There's Blue Osa, which is sort of its own uh, independent of me. I am the owner, but, um, and I, you know, obviously grew it, but Blue Osa Yoga Retreat and Spa is a place that welcomes anybody who wants to come and do yoga. We serve three kinds of clients or customers. Uh, the first one is probably our biggest one, which is yoga teachers who are looking to for a place that they can bring their own yoga groups. So that's actually was my journey before Blue Osa to some degree is because I'm actually leading a group to India next year. Oh, wow. um, but I, I love leading yoga retreats um, and I love looking for interesting and unique places and experiences to give to people. And so when I was leading yoga retreats already in Costa Rica and happened to literally, uh, not figuratively, literally stumble across this incredible place, which is now Blue Osa. And I was just driving down the road and I happened to see the Century 21 sign outside. And that's that's how I found it. And so, so, so we welcome yoga teachers who are looking for places, safe places to bring their students. We're in a very remote area. We're located right on the beach. The sun rises directly in front of our place. And uh, we're surrounded by jungle and, you know, along everything that comes along with the jungle. Um, we also welcome people that are looking for individual retreats. And then I lead my yoga teacher trainings there. Um, I would say that my space or my clinic is kind of uh, a fewfold. Primarily, it's online. So I've been working a lot to reach people in the online world. I have a vast YouTube channel. I have a lot of online uh, content. I have a place called the Yogi Club, which people can access and, and access a lot of my course content um, and practices to become pain-free. So I have like one of my practices I just finished releasing uh, is on the feet foot series. So how to become pain-free in your feet. But I also have like a back pain series, et cetera, et cetera. And I also lead yoga teacher training immersions at Blue Osa, as well as occasionally uh, muscle activation retreats. So people can come and just do a retreat with me. I also lead uh, workshops around the US. So last year I spent a lot of time doing yoga festivals and going to teach at different yoga studios. I'm actually booked to teach in Dallas in, in this coming November. Uh, a workshop. So I do a lot of stuff like that. That's how people can access me and work with me. The best way, of course, is come to Blue Osa and do a yoga teacher training immersion, because that's where you really learn and to get to dive into the philosophy of a yama. That's, uh, that's, that, that's really cool. And I, you know, having 
had the opportunity to spend intensive places in various parts of the world in my spiritual sadhana. And also I spent a good, I used to go for about four months a year to Bali, two months, twice around. Mm. There's some really good intensives over there. And then a lot of my friends, although I haven't taken the trips to Costa Rica, a lot of, it, it seems like those lush tropical kind of environments are very conducive to the immersion and getting away from the hustle and bustle of the city. So it's got to be really cool. How how long have you been running the Blue Osa down there? And what does Osa mean? Well, Osa in Spanish means bear or female bear. Um, mm -hmm. I honestly don't know uh, why. Okay, so Blue Osa is located on the Osa Peninsula. So there's this oh, okay. little peninsula, and it's called the Osa Peninsula. So when we, we were coming up with the name for it, it was kind of like, where are we? We're on the Osa, and then blue is my favorite color. So okay. um, that's kind of how Blue Osa came up. <laughs> so very, 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 very much like the whole, the whole uh, Yama concept. It just you uh -huh. know, for, sort of okay. That's so that's cool. And then before we wrap up, I want to talk a little bit about this rebellion side of things of what you what you determine as a rebellion, and obviously. Um, there's some tongue in cheek there because you're obviously not a rebellious type of, there's, there's, you know, I don't put you in the, like, you know, the Che Guevara or something kind of revolutionary type figure in Costa Rica with some, you know, military bandita wearing yoga camp that's going to like <laughs> rebel against the systems of, of whatever. What, what is this rebellion that you're kind of talking about? Yeah, I think, well, first of all, I, I've always been sort of this person who has challenged um, the system. And so, you know, I've done that in various ways. But an example of that in New York, I started this naked men's yoga, um, which then went on to become like this worldwide sensation. I mean, you know, Saturday Night Live even did a, a little bit about it. Um, that's, that's great. You know, and, and so people, you know, and I, it's not like I'm trying to preach to people, you should do Wade naked yoga. I, that's not my message, but I think in the broader sense, I like it when people get a chance to just kind of witness their own judgmental self or limiting mm -hmm. self. And so mm -hmm. I think like, and, and myself included, by the way, I'm not making myself out to be a saint. I think that we all constantly limit ourselves what is what is the actual limitation like what is the thing that's limiting us it's our own sort of stories judgments opinions and beliefs and so so many people when they heard about you know hot new yoga they're immediately going oh and, you know and then the stories start and sure. so i i like it to challenge like the normal story a little bit and and so I kind of feel like right now with writing Stop Stretching, um, even though it's not like a Che Guevara, I, I think I said that name right. Um, yep. The uh, Even though I'm not like that person, I feel like there's definitely a, been a bit of a blacklist with me in the mm -hmm. yoga world. Like I've applied, you know, I've done some yoga festivals, but there's a lot of yoga festivals. They actually called me up and said, we would love to have you come. And then they ended up ghosting me because I think somebody on the team saw like, Oh, he wrote, stop stretching. You know, he's telling right. us not to stretch and that's not who we are. So there's not even a willingness to have a conversation. And, and so from that perspective, a lot of yoga teachers are kind of terrified of me. And so I've had to really work hard to uh, break through the noise. That's where the rebellion part of it comes, but we're, we're making waves we're getting it out there. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, so, it's so much fun as a, as a, as a, you know, a former raw food vegan bodybuilding champion. I understand what it's like to kind of break norms. Yes. You know, where, where, and and yes. then all of the stuff that comes with it is this, of the, doing my thing is against somebody else. I'm, I'm not against anything. And it's just, I'm, I'm on an explorational pathway and, yeah. unfortunately that exposes paradigm blindness and some people yeah. really want to stay with their paradigm because it's cozy it's comfortable there's uh 
a position of authority, a potential threat to that, a, a way of looking at things. And essentially, yoga is about stripping away those because all of those essentially are creating some form of separation. Now, yeah. we didn't have the joy of an individual life without separation. So there is, I think a lot of people in the spiritual community have set the ego up as some sort of villain in the stories. Yes. And um, which in effect is not entirely accurate. It's it it can play both the um protagonist and the villain. And it can be the the mentor and it can be uh you know it can be a victim or it can be all of those things. And we get to play our own story within that. And so there's a valuable part of it, but we also get to can laugh at ourselves. And I think that's yes. a real being able to flip back and forth to like that hyper motivation and excitement about whatever journey I'm on, but also like laughing at the ridiculousness of oneself. And to me, that's the perfect balance between the yin and the yang of the human experience. Um, can, I, can, people... can I just say something yeah. really quickly about that? Because when I got into this, um, it was kind of really hard for me at the beginning because one of the things that I realized was how much my own sort of ego self-image as a yoga teacher was tied into this whole stretching thing. And right. so, you know, one of the questions I asked had to ask was, or answer was, how am I a yoga teacher if I'm not teaching stretching? And right. what I, I've actually had yoga teachers come up to me and senior yoga teachers who are friends of mine say, if I'm not teaching stretching, then what am I teaching? Um, and so there's this whole, like, I see this, and this is a problem with a lot of yoga teachers because so many of us have this um, ego of I'm a yoga teacher. I teach stretching. If I don't teach stretching, who am I? <laughs> and there's this, there's this, you know, this, so we, it, it's, a, it's another observation on how much we go out into the world to collect evidence, to reaffirm our sense of self and yoga teachers are, I would say, I'm kind of being a little tongue in cheek right now, but even more victims than regular people who, you know, we're trying to help and save. We're the ones that we need to get to work on more than anything. <laughs> yeah, it's it's it, yeah, the, the ironies aren't lost. Uh, you know, uh, I think the bodybuilding community that I founded and was is, is similar on on a, on a on a polarity. It's it's not about That's... stretching; it's about flexing. <laughs> Who am I if I'm not Jack? <laughs> you know, it's just like how good's your downward dog. It's like how much do you bench and how much do you squat and, and you know yes. and all of the all of the derivative arguments within those communities of oh you don't need to bench press or squats or that or whatever like. Yeah. You know, you get all of these variances and then and then these these like yeah, uh, you know, culture is just so fun. It's just yes. such a trip <laughs> when you get down in these worlds. And 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 the idea essentially behind all pathways is is I think you said it the very first, is 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 to tr transcend it. And Bruce Lee talked about what was martial arts the beautiful interview with water and what was martial arts and he goes well if i'm too rigid i become a manical a mechanical man if i'm too animalistic i'm a, i'm too wild so martial arts is the balance of those two aspects expressing myself with not hitting myself or playing a performance or whatever to be in there he says it's very very hard to do and it's a beautiful interview, and I think it can be applied to martial arts, it can be applied to yoga, it can be applied to fitness and whatever. I, I think that it's cool to see that in your own journey, a little bit of our West Coast side, that uh, yeah. we have some common streams. Um, final thoughts, words in, you know, you've been doing yoga for a long time, and you've had a considerable amount of influence, and you've you know, work through all levels and have arrived probably at that position that so many young people who get bitten by the yoga bug would like to be like, oh, you have a following and a center and a beautiful place and you have an, a, a, a discovery of a pathway that's new. I mean, 
that's a lot of accomplishments and achievements that that that, that a lot of people that want to use yoga as a pathway would aspire to be like. What would you say to that person who's starting on their yoga journey or is in that yoga journey or caught in one of those paradigms from your experience that you would say, hey, here's what I'd love to, to share with you right now that's really going to accelerate that path for them? I mean, oh boy, that's, I, I mean, are you asking me, like, what would I say to a new yoga teacher, a fledgling well, well, yoga teacher so, 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 or aspiring yogi or yoga well, teacher? Well, that yoga, that, that kind of aspiring yoga, yoga teacher person that is going to navigate that all of the traps and lures and attention and things that within that community, you, like you've gone through all that. Yeah. What would you what would you share with them to help them mitigate some of that those variables that take you out of what the real goal is or what the real objective is like to, to you know to smoothly navigate to where to what where where you certainly are now. I mean, you know, in our tradition, I wish that somebody. Well, there's two things that I wish that I learned right off the bat, and I'm obvious. The first one is obvious: stop stretching and and stop you know stop stretching um there's nothing more to say about that uh, i wish that i had understood biomechanics better and i would just say to anybody if you can get a leg up on proper uh real biomechanics you'll be a leg up the other thing is find a teacher like go mm. and find a real teacher um part of finding a real teacher is finding somebody who might rub you the wrong way um, mm -hmm. or finding somebody that you don't always agree with. Um, there is a lot to be said about putting your ego at the foot of the teacher. And that's not a very PC thing to say these days, um, which is a whole other conversation, but you know, Rod, Rod and I have a very weird relationship and I'm not going to get into all of it, but despite, you know, who he is as a person and, and sort of what's transpired between us, I still have a lot of love and respect for him. He'll always be, you know, in my heart, um, a big part of what it means to be guru. And so I, he's the one who, helped me tear back the veil between the seen and the unseen until I met Rod. No teacher had ever done that. Um, and he managed to do it in a very profound way that is still, you know, very palpable uh, feeling within the cave of my heart. And so our teachers appear to us in very strange ways. And, um, and it doesn't always have to be a spiritual teacher. You know, one of my teacher, a couple of my teachers come from when I was a kid and I was growing up in, in high school. And so some of my teachers were people that were, you know, my high school teachers, but they always challenged me to become the better version of myself. And when I just submitted and, and surrendered, you know, instead of always trying to fight them, which is what we see, you know, this epidemic of students thinking that they know better, um, they're not learning anything and teachers aren't able to show up in the same way for students. And so I, you know, it's kind of my advice is like, find a teacher and don't follow them blindly. Like I'm not saying, mm. you know, mm. when the teacher says, give you, you know, sign over the lease to your house, then you should literally run the opposite direction. I mean, obviously, <laughs> please um, use your common yeah. sense, of course. But, you know, when the teacher says, come and visit you, like my teacher, Alan, a couple of years ago, he sent me a message, Aaron, come to Florida and see me. I looked at my date. I said, I can come in two weeks. Is that okay? He said, yes. I mean, you just don't question it. You just, your teacher says, come, you come. And we've really lost that devotion to a teacher who represents the best part of who we can become in life. And so that's what you're looking for in a teacher is someone that you're aspiring to become the best version of yourself. And you do that with full devotion, full love and um, and then you go and listen and you stop talking. <laughs> very, very well said. Um, I can think of my coaches 
um, influenced teachers. They, they they challenged all of those areas, both in the physical and the mental and the spiritual realms. They challenged my beliefs. And not in a way that was punitive or to put me down, but was to invite me to consider a, a, a higher truth, a deeper truth, a refinement of my understanding. And inside of that, you have to sit within that for a while and it's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But that's yeah. where the growth in the pathway lies. So I, I would totally, that's, that's I think, astute advice. And, and I think for all those out there listening that are on that pathway, yoga is a beautiful pathway and provides so many wonderful opportunities and experiences. I think it really expands life to things, the people you get to meet, the places you get to go, the things that you get to learn, the, 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 the discipline of the practice, the physical, mental, emotional benefits that it, it can entail from it. And I think it's people like you that are bringing a wider uh, understanding of what yoga can be, true union, and what that entails, and how to, to go about that. So where can people find out more and, you know, go to your websites and get your books and check out your podcast. Just unabashedly share all that you have with our <laughs> listeners so they can... So they can can integrate um, if, if something resonates with them and, and to take this on for their next step in their journey. Yeah, I, the best thing for people to do is go to yogiaron.com, Y-O-G-I-A-A-R-O-N.com. They can get access to everything there. Um, you know, you can also go to Amazon and search Stop Stretching uh, and find my book. You can find my eight-part series uh, podcast. And then of course, find me on YouTube. Um, but my website definitely is a gateway or a portal into all that stuff. I also have a lot of free stuff. Um, there's a, you know, I have a seven days to becoming pain-free series that people can get onto and start getting a taste of what it's like to live your best pain-free life. So I would just end it by saying that, you know, a lot of people living in pain and, and, I, I'm saying this from personal experience. There's so much of a feeling of dread sometimes, of depression, of feeling like, oh my God, is this my life? If I'm, you know, I'm 52 right now, do I have to spend the next 50, 60 years living like this? Um, do I need to take more <laughs> drugs? Um, and I just want to just really reaffirm that there are answers. You don't have to be in pain. Uh, and we can get you out of pain. And I'm here committed to help, you know, anybody who comes in my space to living their best pain-free life. Um, so if you want me, I'm here. Uh, contact me on my website. Contact me on Instagram. That's always a really great place to get a hold of me as well. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Yogi Aaron. For all our listeners, I hope that you will check out Yogi Aaron's website and his information. I think it could be very valuable to you on your journey. Of course, um, if you like it, share it. Um, if you have some comments for us, we'd love to hear it. And more importantly, you know, continue on the path to living your best life. Yoga is a transformative aspect that fuses so many different aspects of culture. And I think it's needed more than ever today in this increasingly technologically dominant society. It's a way to go within and all of the answers that you're looking for within. So I'm Wayne T. Lightheart from Bioptimizers. This is the Awesome Health Podcast Show. We'll see you on the next episode. At Bioptimizers, our mission is to fix digestion. And a cornerstone of digestion is gut flora. P3OM is our patented probiotic formula. In fact, we call it the Navy SEALs of probiotics. You see, strong proteolytic or protein digesting activity is paramount to having a healthy gut flora. And of course, P3OM provides that. The good news is, unlike weaker probiotics, P3OM survives the digestion process. What it does is it basically multiplies the good guys while protecting you against pathogens or what some people call the bad guys. P3OM really helps to rebuild your digestion. And what that allows you to do is to maximize nutrient uptake, energy, and metabolism. To find out more of how P3OM can help you, go to www.bioptimizers.com. Thank you for listening to the Bioptimizers Awesome Health Podcast. 
You can find more information at bioptimizers.com. <laughs>